Okay, so uh, just to remind you where we ended up last time. Um, <coughs> we uh, summarized all the laws of electri electricity, magnetism, and, and magnetism, i.e. Maxwell's equations, in these two equations. So, uh, just to remind you, these indices, alpha, beta, go from 0, 1, 2, 3. This index is for CT. <coughs> CT. These indices are spatial indices. And, um, and we have this uh, matrix, eta alpha beta, which is diagonal. And it's the, we also have its inverse, eta with upstairs indices. Uh, we have derivatives. Uh, we needed this eta because you'll notice in these equations, the f in this equation has upper indices, but here it has lower indices. And the way to go from upper to lower is using eta. So eta was essential in these equations. Um, and uh, we had partial derivatives. We had the current which is the charge density times C and the current density. And we had this tensor epsilon alpha beta gamma delta, the totally anti-symmetric tensor with epsilon 0, 1, 2, 3 equals 1. <clears throat> so with all of that uh, notation, we... we uh, we're able to write these equations down. And this was the foundation for uh, relativity. Because once you have the equations written in this form, it is obvious there is a certain symmetry. Okay, so uh, let me describe what the what the symmetry is. Um, uh, which is known as Lorentz. Invariance, and uh, this was discovered by Lorentz in 1904, and it's worth looking at his paper. Uh, obviously, he didn't have this notation, so everything is much more clumsy and cumbersome. But he noticed there was a symmetry which involves space and time and the electric and magnetic fields. Uh, the symmetry is the following: that you, you see, uh, if I think about uh, classical mechanics, everybody was used to the fact that the equations of classical mechanics, for example, the equation of motion for a particle, that F equals ma, uh, mass times the acceleration is equal to minus the gradient of the potential, uh, that equation is obviously rotationally invariant. Obviously invariant under x being changed to x prime, which is a rotation matrix times x. Uh, so this is a 3 by 3 rotations. And O transpose O equals 1. Um, 
because if you look at this equation, if I just rotate, uh, if I just prime everything, the prime is just uh, O times X. And so, uh, so this goes, this, if I prime everything, this is MX double dot prime minus uh, equals minus, well, let's put them all on the, the left-hand side. This equals zero. So if I calculate this quantity plus uh, grad prime V, this is obviously equal to the rotation matrix, which is just a constant matrix, times mx double dot plus grad V, and uh, that was zero by the original equation. So you can see that priming everything, changing to the new coordinate system, leaves the original equation satisfied. That's clear because if I have some mechanical system which is evolving, what are the coordinates x anyway? Well, they were totally arbitrary. I mean, I could use for x, y, and z, I can use the height from that corner, the length along here, the length along the wall, except it's not quite at right angles, but imagine it was at right angles. And that would be my x, y, z, but I could equally well just rotate the coordinate system and use those. There's nothing to prefer one over the other, and the equations are uh, rotational invariant. Okay, so uh, everyone was used to that fact. Uh, what they were not used to was rotations in space and time, and that's what Lorentz noticed. So Lorentz uh, transformation is a rotation in space and time, uh, which is that x uh, prime alpha is lambda alpha beta x beta. You have to be careful about upstairs and downstairs indices and to keep track of them. So x has an upstairs index. When I rotate x, I multiply with a matrix. Uh, this, uh, this index is summed, so that's the analog of matrix. It is just matrix multiplication. This means a three by three matrix multiplied by a vector. This is the same thing, except I've written the indices uh, out. And, um, um, and then, of course, it follows from this that um, uh, this means that dx, sorry, partial d by dx alpha, which is uh, uh, dx prime beta by dx alpha d by dx prime beta um, is, is equal to lambda beta alpha um, d by dx prime alpha. Okay, and so if we're going to express derivatives with respect to the prime coordinates in terms of derivatives with respect to the original coordinates, I've got to invert this matrix lambda, okay? Because I want to multiply, I have to multiply that equation by the inverse. So what we'll do is uh, define uh, a lambda twiddle matrix. So we have lambda alpha beta and lambda twiddle beta gamma. This guy's the inverse of lambda. So I'm using uh, just ordinary matrix multiplication, and that by definition is delta alpha gamma. And uh, so then this implies, this equation implies uh, d by dx prime alpha is lambda twiddle uh, beta alpha d by dx beta. Okay, so this is uh, simple enough uh, to remember that upper indices transform with lambda and uh, down and lower indices indices transform with lambda twiddle, the inverse of lambda.
Um, so let's think of all the different quantities. We have, uh, yeah, uh, let me write down another equation. If lambda twiddle is the inverse of lambda, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, isn't it if, you, if, if an index is... Um, oh, sorry, I've got this index wrong. Right, right okay. Thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Indices, uh, when indices, indices should be contracted. Yeah. Um, the, the indices on the left and the right have to match, uh, and, and when I contract two indices, that sort of removes them. Um, thank you. I think I got this one right. Any, any other questions? Um, okay, so let's think about all the... Oh, um, sorry, I was just in the middle of saying... Uh, this equation um, that lambda lambda twiddle is 1 because lambda twiddle is the inverse of lambda. If lambda twiddle is the right inverse of lambda, it's also the left inverse of lambda. Okay, that's a theorem from linear, linear algebra. So it also follows that lambda twiddle uh, beta gamma lambda gamma alpha is delta beta alpha. Okay, so lambda twiddle uh, is the inverse on either the left or the right of lambda. Um, and so let's think about all the quantities we have in the Maxwell equations. Uh, we have the current. So this is going to transform like a four vector. just has one index. We have the field strength tensor. That's got two indices. That's going to transform with two lambda matrices. Uh, OK. And obviously, the field strength tensor with lowered indices is going to transform with two lambda twiddles. Um, if I have uh, something, so anything, a quantity, well, let's say it this way, two contracted indices, uh, do not transform. Or let's say transform tri uh, trivially. Transform trivially. Trivially means without any lambdas. So, for example, if I have A alpha B alpha, one up and one down, then if I prime this guy, I get, um, I get uh, lambda alpha beta A beta times lambda twiddle uh, alpha gamma B gamma. But lambda lambda twiddle is uh, delta gamma beta, so that's equal to A gamma B gamma. So if, uh, if you have contracted indices, you don't need to bother uh, inserting any lambdas. Um, finally, let's think about this epsilon factor. We don't really need it in the Maxwell equations. We wrote it out in a form which doesn't involve epsilon, but let's do it anyway. Uh, it's, it's useful for future. That uh, epsilon alpha beta gamma delta prime, this is, of course, um, epsilon chi psi. I'm running out of Greek letters. Uh, let me not use epsilon. That's too confusing. Uh, psi times... Uh, lambda alpha chi lambda beta psi lambda uh, gamma eta lambda uh, delta psi. Okay. And again, from linear algebra, the epsilon tensor multiplied by a matrix to the appropriate powers when I contract with one index of the matrix. Do you know what this is equal to? 
determinant, algebra. exactly. Algebra. So this is from linear algebra. When I form this quantity out of a matrix, this is just equal to epsilon alpha beta gamma delta times the determinant of lambda. So this is one way to define the determinant. It is exactly identical to the usual expression. If you're used to writing out the matrix and then doing this whole process of calculating the determinant by this times the, the subdeterminants and all that, it's completely equivalent to just writing this out. Okay, and so now what is the determinant of lambda? Well, we know that uh, lambda, um, oh, I haven't even said it yet. Uh, there's one very important property of lambda, in fact, the defining property of lambda. So let me, let me say that most important Okay, is what about the eta? Well, that eta matrix is defined to be minus 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, and if we want the equations to be valid in the new coordinate system, it better have the same eta, otherwise it won't be the same equations. So uh, the most important uh, uh, transformation we have to use is that eta prime mu nu, which has... Um, which has, uh, or let's do it with upstairs indices first, it's eta prime alpha beta, which is lambda alpha gamma lambda beta delta eta gamma delta, uh, that better equal to eta alpha beta. So eta is invariant under Lorentz transformations. Um, and uh, so actually this is the defining property defining property of Lorentz transformations and we can write it as a matrix it, in, a, in a matrix form, that lambda eta lambda transpose equals eta. You see, if I look at that equation there, um, um, if I, uh, let's just write it out, lambda uh, alpha, what, did I, what indices did I use? Gamma lambda beta delta, eta gamma delta, um, clearly this matrix multiplying eta, that's a normal matrix product, but this one is being multiplied with the second ind index, okay, so the row column, column here is going with the column there, and so you can write this, you can check that actually this is equivalent to the statement that lambda eta lambda transpose is eta. <laughs> and uh, this, of course, implies that if I take the determinant of this equation, the determinant of a product of matrices is the product of the determinant, determinants. Okay, and the determinant of a transpose is the determinant of the matrix. So this implies that the determinant of lambda, determinant of eta is just uh, minus one, eta equals det eta, sorry, det lambda squared, and so this implies determinant of lambda equals, this is equal to minus one, determinant lambda is plus or minus one. So the Lorentz transformation matrices come in two types. One of them has determinant plus one, and those Lorentz matrices, we, we say, are connected to the identity because they all have the same determinant as the identity. If you consider this matrix with some parameters, uh, we'll, we'll do that in a minute, 
um, uh, they, as you vary those parameters away from the identity, the determinant remains plus one. The other, the other set of uh, Lorentz transformations, their determinant's minus one, and it's disconnected from the identity. There's no smooth way uh, to deform uh, in the Lorentz transformations such a matrix to the identity. So we say this is the connected, uh, and this is disconnected. Uh, to the identity. Um, yeah. Doesn't the minus one times the identity is, isn't that like disconnected as well? Sorry? Isn't minus one times the identity disconnected as well? No, because uh, minus, if you take the uh, Lorentz transformation, which is this, yep. uh, determine is what? Yeah, yeah. So that's connected. But can you path connect it to the identity? Yes. Okay. <laughs> if you like have a Lorentz transformation though that um, flips the time direction and yes. then flips the spatial. Yes. Good point. It still, couldn't it still have determinant one? And yes. That, that's so this guy. This matrix. That's exactly this one. So this so, one is flipping time. <laughs> and space, but the determinant is one, and it's actually connected to the identity. So uh, we can try and uh, construct this, but you, you're actually, um, um, okay, let me just, uh, let me think about this. It's just PT. This is PT. Um, I, I don't understand what that means. Yeah, uh, in fact, it's I not, believe I, I believe it's not connected to the energy. Yeah, I think not. you're right. There are four connected. I think you're right. There are four components. Sorry, what I said was wrong. There are four components. Um, there are four components. We have time reversal, parity. Yeah, I, c I could do this in more detail. I believe what happens when you analyze this equation carefully is that the lambda zero zero, lambda zero zero is always greater than one. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, I think yeah. some of the matrices are lambda zero zero is bigger than one, and some of them are less than minus one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's a similar story with parity. So basically, there are. Mm, let me see. Yeah, we say there are four components. I believe. Uh, Yeah, uh, how, how should I say it? Um, so it's, it's like... Okay, so we have these two. We have debt lambda equals plus or minus one. And then we, I think we have lambda. It's probably easy to show, in fact, uh, if we look at this equation. Um, because, I won't try and do it now. <laughs> okay. But there are, there are four components of the Lorentz group. One of them has determinant equal to one. And time and parity are both even. Okay, uh, one of them has time odd, um, parity odd, parity odd and, then PT. and then uh, and then PT odd. Yeah, I I can try and uh, talk more about that. Okay, I'm not going to use this in, in the course at all. It's important in particle physics, but I'm I'm not going to be using that at all. So, so let me just make a note here. The Lorentz group group has four components. Let's say four connected components. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, if you if you look in any particle physics textbook, it explains that. It's all just derived from this equation. Um, okay, so so here are Lorentz transformations, and what we have just shown is that if I take uh, these equations here and I prime them, 
just prime everything, is still valid. Um, and so that proves that um, because they're equal to lambda times the original equations, which were valid. Okay, this, this quantity primed is just lambda times the original quantity. This quantity primed is just lambda times the original quantity. So provided lambda is invertible, is an invertible matrix, you can remove it. Uh, this guarantees it's invertible because this guarantees its determinant is plus or minus one. Condition for it to be invertible is that the determinant doesn't vanish. So um, uh, these are symmetries of the um, Maxwell equations. So the most uh, simple example of Lorentz transformation, so a simple example, is just a rotation. That's a, a, a 2D rotation. OK, so let's imagine that we had some coordinates uh, x and y. These are just two of our spatial coordinates. And we rotate the coordinate system. So we measure x prime and y prime. We're going to rotate by some angle theta. So this angle is also theta. Um, then uh, the value of x prime, so if this is, so if I um, consider some point here, which is x comma y, then the value of x prime is given by dropping the perpendicular to the x prime axis. Okay, so this quantity would be x, and this, sorry, this quantity would be x prime, and this quantity here would be y prime. Okay? And uh, then it's just a matter of simple geometry. I'll leave it to you to, to show it, that you can show that uh, x prime is x cos theta plus y sine theta and y prime is y cos theta minus x sine theta. So just to uh, spell it out, this x coordinate is, of course, that length, and the y coordinate is this length. OK, so just using... Uh, uh, ordinary geometry, you can show that this is true. Uh, and it follows from this that x prime, let, let me just leave that as an exercise. Show that. And uh, it follows from this that x prime squared plus y prime squared is x squared plus y squared. Uh, lengths are invariant under rotations. Okay, so if I square x prime squared, I'm going to get um, x squared cos squared from this term. If I square y prime squared, I'll get x squared sine squared. The cos squared plus sine squared gives 1. The cross terms obviously cancel because I get 2xy cos theta sine theta minus sine here. They cancel, and uh, so you can see that this quantity equals um, x squared plus y squared. And so... It follows that the Lorentz transformation, in which I do nothing to the time direction, but I rotate um, between x and y. So x and y are the uh, second and third rows and columns. So if I just put a rotation in here, minus sine theta, cos theta, and zeros everywhere else. OK, uh, this is a valid uh, Lorentz uh, transformation. And, uh, and you can check that. Uh, 
um, lambda eta lambda transpose equals eta. <clears throat> so that's not so interesting, something we already knew, that, the, that physics is invariant under rotating coordinates. But let's try a Lorentz transformation involving time. And of course, when we involve time, we have to deal with this minus sign in the eta, which changes everything. So if we consider a Lorentz transformation involving time, uh, the minus sign Um, so just by playing around with it, you will find that you need to do the following. Uh, cos theta becomes cos theta, and sine theta becomes sinh theta. Um, and minus sinh theta cos theta, and then 1 one, zeros everywhere else. So this also satisfies lambda eta lambda transpose equals one, equals eta. Okay, so Lorentz transformations are like, or time-dependent time Lorentz transformations are uh, like rotations, but where cosine changes to cosh and sine changes to sinh, and that's because uh, of the minus sign. And so, for ex so what this means is that ct prime is ct cosh theta minus x sinh theta, and x prime is uh, x cosh theta minus ct sinh theta. And now you uh, immediately see the difference with rotations, which is the quantity ct prime squared minus x squared, x prime squared, is equal to ct squared minus x squared. Or maybe I should put the minus sign here. It doesn't really matter, of course. But the key thing is that time comes with a minus sign. OK, so let's check that. CT prime squared, I'm going to get a minus cosh squared times CT squared. And then here I'm going to get a, um, a, a plus sine squared. So minus cosh squared plus sine squared is minus 1. So we're going to use this identity, minus sine squared equals 1. Whereas before we used cos squared plus sine squared theta is, is 1. Uh, this minus sign here is extremely important. Okay? Uh, it's basically the unique thing about gravity. It's what separates time from space. It, it sort of explains how the universe, why the universe depends on time. Uh, it's the root of uh, many, many things. This minus sign is the most important minus sign in physics. <laughs> okay? uh, it allows physics to exist, <laughs> that minus sign. Otherwise, space and time would be the same, and uh, nothing, much would ever, nothing would ever change. So that minus sign is responsible for change in, in, in the world. It's a, it's a very important thing, and it will come up again and again and again in physics. How do we deal with this? Minus sign. Um, OK, so the, this is mathematics. This is the mathematical transformation. And then, of course, the genius of Einstein was to figure out what the physical meaning was of transformations like this. 
Lorentz just noticed it as a mathematical property. Uh, Einstein realized what, what the physical meaning was. And, uh, and that changed everything. So one year after Lorentz had written this uh, paper, Einstein wrote his uh, paper which launched special relativity and essentially was just interpreting Lorentz's transformations as a physical property of the world. So the physical uh, meaning is the following. If I, if I think of space-time... coordinates, so treat time as just another coordinate, uh, then, of course, I, I would describe the world as a collection of objects in space-time, uh, moving around in this uh, space-time arena. Um, and the point of these transformations is that you can change coordinates, just as we could rotate the coordinates for this room without any physical uh, consequence, we can do a Lorentz transformation on the coordinates on space-time. And uh, so, um, if we look at these coordinates and try to figure out what they mean, well, the CT prime axis is the locus on which X prime is zero, right? Just as the T axis is a CT axis is the locus where x equals zero. So to get the CT prime axis, I said x prime equals zero. So that means x is CT tanh theta. So the CT prime axis in this diagram, okay, this is CT equals x tanh theta. It's just the locus x prime equals zero. Um, and then the x prime axis is the locus ct prime equals zero. Right? Is that clear? I have these coordinates, x and ct, and what I mean by the ct prime axis is the set of points which all have x prime equals zero. What I mean by the x prime axis is the set of points which all have ct prime equals zero. So the x prime axis is where ct prime equals zero, so what I see here is that um, ct is x. Uh, sorry, did I do it wrong? Yeah, I think I did this one wrong. Um, the ct prime axis is where x prime equals zero, so ct is x over tanh theta. Well, let's write it this way. x equals ct tanh theta. Okay, so... Um, if you think about x, a relationship between x and ct, what it's saying is that it's a straight line whose slope is tanh theta. This is less than 1. So, if, uh, so, so basically, the, the slope must be this way. The x prime axis, right, this is the locus um, ct prime equals 0. And so from here, you see ct is x tanh theta. Okay, and tanh theta is less than 1. So, Lorentz transformations are not rotations of the axes. What they correspond to is pushing the x prime axis up, tilting it upwards, and tilting the t axis this way. Okay, so you're just taking these axes, and you're closing them like this. Okay, and then, of course, the coordinates you define, so the locus of all points with a fixed value of x prime, they will be parallel to the ct prime axis. Okay? And the locus of points of fixed ct prime will be parallel to the x prime axis. Okay? I've drawn that quite badly. I'm sorry. Should all be parallel. Okay? And um, 
So it's completely clear from this picture that all you're doing is changing coordinates. You've got this arena. You had your coordinates with perpendicular axes. You're now making non-perpendicular axes. But you're just covering the space with uh, parallel lines. Every point has a coordinate. It's absolutely impossible for any inconsistency to arise. <laughs> OK? So from the geometrical picture, all you've done is change coordinates. Uh, manifestly a consistent thing to do. So whenever you see a paper on the archive or anywhere else, and there are a million papers claiming to prove Einstein wrong, usually they miss this point. They get involved in algebra. They make some sign mistake somewhere. They say, oops, I found an inconsistency. It's absolutely impossible for an inconsistency to arise if all you're doing is you changing coordinates from one system to another. Okay? So uh, the, the arena of space-time uh, is just being described in a different coordinate system. And, um, and now let's ask the... Imagine somebody who's using the CT prime and X prime coordinates. What, what is different about them than the original... Uh, the, uh, somebody using the X and CT coordinates. Well, an observer, O prime, using the CT prime and X prime coordinates, okay, uh, is stationary in those coordinates. Okay, so in particular, this observer would say, well, um, I'm at x prime equals zero, for example. Okay, in other words, I'm just tr running up the CT prime axis. Okay, so that would be the trajectory of this observer. And uh, um, they are moving. O prime is moving relative to an observer O using the CT and X coordinates with a velocity. What, what is the velocity of O prime? Okay, so imagine you're now observer O and you see this observer O prime running up here. Uh, just fixed in x prime, but increasing in t prime, you would say they're, they're moving, right? And you, they're moving according to this equation. Is moving with a velocity uh, c tanh theta. Because you're saying their coordinate in the O system, x equals c tanh theta times t. So in other words, i.e., v equals c tanh theta. And uh, theta is called the, it's a dimensionless number called the rapidity. Um, clearly, in this picture, you cannot describe an observer moving faster than c because tanh theta is always less than or equal to 1. Okay, so no observer, no observer can have v bigger than c because tanh theta is less than or equal to 1. And... Uh, in fact, that's true with a magnitude sign. <clears throat> so we can't describe observers moving faster than the speed of light. Uh, we can only describe observers going up to the speed of light. Um, So rapidity is the analog of angle. 
rapidity of a Lorentz transformation is the analog of the angle theta of a rotation. It's a dimensionless parameter uh, measuring the size of the transformation. For angles, they go from 0 to 2 pi, but rapidity goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And as the rapidity changes, the velocity goes from minus c to plus c. Um, so just to translate this into uh, more traditional language, uh, because remember the, trans the, the Lorentz transformation is this guy. I know what tanh theta is now in terms of the velocity of the uh, observer. So I just need to express cosh theta in terms of tanh theta to see what the Lorentz transformation is. And this is a standard identity, tanh theta squared, right? Because uh, tanh is cosh over cinch, and so cosh squared, over, sorry, cinch squared over cosh, cinch over cosh, so cinch squared over cosh squared, multiply through by the cosh squared, I get cosh squared minus cinch squared, which is one. The cos squared, the cosh squared in the denominator comes to the numerator. And uh, so this, of course, is equal to um, 1 over root 1 minus v squared over c squared. And this is defined to be gamma the, the, uh, in the usual way of writing Lorentz transformations. And likewise, the Sanch theta, of course, is just cosh theta times tanh theta. And so this is gamma times v over c. And so the... Lorentz transformation, uh, which we had over here, we called it, uh, let's call it by that symbol, is just um, uh, T prime equals gamma T minus Vx over C squared. So I've just divided by C in this formula. Use the fact that cosh theta is gamma, uh, sinh theta is gamma v over c, and, uh, and then x prime is gamma x minus vt. And the inverse, well, in fact, the, the same Lorentz transformation, um, this is the relationship between the t x coordinates and the t prime x coordinates, you can invert that to find the relation between t and uh, to express t and x in terms of t prime and x prime. And t is gamma t prime. Uh, so the inverse matrix lambda, you can check that lambda twiddle, all I do is reverse theta. Theta goes to minus theta gives me the inverse matrix. So lambda twiddle is cosh and then plus sinh minus sinh, oh, sorry, plus sinh cosh. Okay, you can see that because if I multiply first row by um, first column, I'm going to get cosh squared minus sinh squared, which is one. First row by second column, I'm going to get cosh cinch minus cosh cinch, which is zero, etc. Okay, so this is the inverse matrix, and the inverse matrix is what comes into this uh, relationship between t x and t prime x prime. So this is just uh, plus v over c squared x prime, and x is equal to gamma x prime plus v t prime. Okay, so using those formulae, we can easily go back and forth between the tx and t prime x prime coordinates.
notice that if x equals ct, okay, so that uh, x equals ct is the trajectory of a particle at the speed of light, trajectory of particle moving at the speed of light, of light, then um, x prime is gamma c minus v t, and uh, t prime is gamma 1 minus v over c times t, and this implies that x prime equals c t prime. So uh, anything moving at the speed of light does so for all observers. Okay, so now we come back to this issue of relativity, the inconsistency between Maxwell's result that there's a special speed, the speed of light, which failed to mention who was measuring it, okay? That was the paradox. Maxwell found the speed of light, but there was no mention of which observer saw that speed. And that sounded weird because people thought that speeds depend on how fast you move. Speeds are relative. But here we see that according to relativity, which is the symmetry of the Maxwell equations, all observers are guaranteed to agree that the speed of light is the, that something moving at the speed of light moves at the speed of light. All observers will agree. So this con the inconsistency inconsistency between relativity, which goes back to Galileo. To Galileo and <coughs> Maxwell uh, derivation of the speed of light is resolved. Okay, but it's resolved at a huge cost. The cost is that all of classical mechanics is wrong. Because <laughs> all of classical mechanics was built on Galileo's idea about re relativity, according to which different observers would see different velocity. So uh, that's the cost, is we are now going to have to revise all of classical mechanics. Um, and that, that's what happened with the theory of special relativity. Um, so, uh, this leads to some uh, amazing results. Uh, so let's talk about the most basic things in classical mechanics, which are how we measure the, where particles are and how they move. And therefore, we need to use clocks and rulers. So just in describing the motion of particles, we need clocks and rulers. And uh, let's think about what a clock is. So a clock... We should put it in our space-time diagram, ct versus x. And what is a clock on that diagram? How would you describe a clock 
on that diagram. By a clock, I mean something that ticks like once a second. Tick, 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 tick. Where is the clock on that diagram? Go straight up the... Yeah, so a clock which is sitting at x equals zero, if my wrist is x equals zero, then, and the clock is my watch, then it doesn't move in x, okay? So, but it goes up the t-axis because t is advancing, and uh, every second it ticks, and so ct changes by 3 times 10 to the 8 every second. Okay? So that's, that's the, these are the ticks of the clock. Now, likewise, um, if uh, let's draw, let's imagine a clock was moving. Okay, and I've got to close these axes to describe a, a moving clock. Uh, here, here is the speed of light. Okay, this line is x equals ct, so that's the speed of light. Uh, a, any clock moving with a speed less than the speed of light is going to be going up uh, this axis. Okay, so this is the moving clock. The ticks of a moving clock. Because that clock should sit at x prime equals zero, i.e. on the t prime axis and uh, just go, go forward along the t-prime axis. So uh, for the moving clock, uh, x-prime equals zero always, but uh, t-prime will be zero, one, two, three. Okay, the ticks of the clock just advance by one second um, every tick. And so now we can figure out what x is. So uh, what x and t are, so let's go up to that equation and see we have uh, t and x in terms of x prime and t prime. So t is equal to, well, x prime is 0 and t prime is uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. So obviously t is gamma uh, and it is, t will be 0, gamma, 2 gamma, 3 gamma, okay? And uh, x, by the second, by the last formula up there, uh, x prime is 0, t prime advances, so x is obviously equal to um, uh, x is, uh, well, Actually, it's easier to go to the second equation. x prime is 0, so you see that x equals vt. So x is 0 times gamma v, 2 gamma v, da 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 da, which is just vt. So the clock that's moving, all right, second equation is saying the obvious thing. x is vt. Okay, it's moving. This equation is quite strange. It's saying that the, according to me, if I see a clock that's moving, the clock is ticking once a second, but according to me, it's ticking once every gamma seconds. Okay? So if gamma is a huge number, it only ticks very rarely. Okay? In other words, so this is called uh, time dilation. And so a clock which is moving appears to run very slowly, according to the observer who's not moving. Um, and this is observed every day of the week at the Large Hadron Collider. They send particles up to 0.999, the speed of light. They watch their behavior, their decays, and so on. And the decays are hugely slowed down by the fact that they're moving near the speed of light. In fact, another classic example is cosmic rays. You know, we detect cosmic rays from outer space that hit the Earth's upper atmosphere. Uh, so particles hit the Earth's up, up, upper atmosphere. They create a shower of particles, including, including uh, muons, which are unstable. The muons have a certain lifetime, 
But if the muons decayed in our coordinates with their standard, uh, with their lifetime, with the same lifetime that they have in their rest frame, there wouldn't be enough time for them to make it to the Earth's, uh, to, to the to ground. Okay, but they would decay in the upper atmosphere, and we never see them on on the on the ground. But cosmic rays are detected on the ground, and the way that happens is that the muons are moving very close to the speed of light, and even though they decay in their coordinates at a fixed rate, in our coordinates it takes much longer, and that's why we see them. So it was um, it was a puzzle how you could even see cosmic rays on the ground. How do they last so long when we know they decay too fast for us to see them? The puzzle was. Uh, resolved by this uh, time dilation effect. And, uh, you know, the way I like to summarize this is that if you want to stay young, you know, keep moving. <laughs> the faster you move, everyone else will think, wow, you're staying young so, so well, right? Because then all you're doing is moving around very fast. Yeah? Particles. Yeah. So does it mean that we were detecting them even before Einstein's? No, we weren't. I'm, I'm making up the history. <laughs> <laughs> no, we weren't. But uh, it would have been a puzzle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it was uh, very direct evidence in favor of this idea. You know, you, you, what is just totally astonishing is 1905. You know, Einstein was so clear that this must be true, right? And yet there was essentially zero experimental evidence. Okay? But Einstein was so convinced that this symmetry really is a symmetry of nature that he said it just must be this way. And if you read the papers, I mean, they're astonishing. They basically say not only is this a symmetry of electromagnetism, but it must be a symmetry of everything. Anyone who invents a law of physics in the future, this will be a symmetry. Okay. So they were bold to the nth degree. So they were basically saying when people study the laws of nuclear physics, of particle physics, whatever they do, they're going to find this is true. Okay? And they were right. It's incredible. <laughs> they were totally right. Uh, that uh, this, this uh, picture of the laws of physics has amazing power and validity. So, for example, you know, just... Two years ago, there was this claim that neutrinos are moving faster than the speed of light. And the reaction of most uh, theoretical physicists, well, one of great excitement, lots of people here will work around, yeah, great, you know, maybe relativity is wrong. But uh, most theoretical physicists are saying, well, you know, if that's correct, we're going to have to revise everything. Okay? All the agreements we have between theory and observations are all going to have to be revised. And because we've become so confident that the standard model fits particle physics so accurately, that sounds rather implausible. So most theorists who worked on you know, particle physics and, uh, and other physics were saying, you know, the problem is when you've got a symmetry, and there's so much evidence for the symmetry, you know, and now you want to destroy it, the whole edifice of physics is going to collapse. <laughs> so we're both excited but also skeptical that something so major would, uh, would be true. And indeed, it turned out it was an experimental error. So, um, okay, so something equally interesting, I said clocks and rulers. Let's, uh, let's talk about rulers. <laughs> So we measure distances with rulers, and we want to know, is everyone going to agree at least on what the length of an object is or the, on some distance? And the answer is no. Uh, people are not going to agree on what distances are. Um, so let's do the same thing, ct and x. And so what is a ruler or what is a measuring rod in this picture? How would I draw it? You know, what's the defining feature 
of a measuring object, an object that measures length. Take a clock and spin it about. <laughs> <laughs> Take a clock. Take a clock and spin it about your x equals CTX. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, do you want to put it that way? Yeah. Like this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, literally take your watch and yeah. just flip it about CT, right? That way. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> yes, so uh, a measuring rod has to have two ends. Okay, that's all it needs. Two ends separated by some definite distance. Okay, so I won't even bother with the other ticks of the rod. Let's, uh, you're right, if it's an infinite rod or it's a tape, it should have multiple ticks. Let's just take two. So, but yeah, that's a good point. A measuring, measuring rod is just a clock going in the x direction. <laughs> okay, and um, uh, and so of course this end of the rod uh, travels along that line in space time. Okay, so we will call this end uh, x equals zero, this end x equals l, and. Um, we, the, this measuring gadget will provide a coordinate, an x-coordinate, everywhere in space-time. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before. Let's consider a moving ruler. Okay, so tt x. This is a static stationary ruler. But I'm really interested in uh, whether the moving guy is going to uh, see the same distances as the stationary uh, guy. So let's consider a moving ruler. And so one end of the ruler is going to be running up the CT prime axis. Um, and the other one is going to be moving up another line parallel to that. So this, this will be x, x prime equals 0. That's one end of the ruler. And then the other end of the ruler is going to be going up here, x prime equals L. And uh, the ruler, I should think about it <coughs> in the CT prime coordinates. The ruler is this object, which at uh, t prime equals 0 is here. OK, uh, this is t prime equals 0 this line, and then, of course, it just uh, sort of moves upwards in space-time like uh, this. So that's, uh, that's a moving ruler uh, described at fixed time in the T prime coordinate system. Um, so uh, let's see what's the length of this ruler. In the O coordinates. So let's say assume the length. So the ruler has length L. Has in the O prime coordinates. L in the O prime coordinates. What is its length in the O coordinates? Um, well, you see, it's clear that in the O coordinates, this end of the ruler is not at the right time. Okay, if I want to measure the length of a ruler, I need to measure its length at a given time in the O coordinates. So I've got it. So even though here this point has C T prime equals X prime equals zero and also ct equals x equals 0. So this end of the ruler is good. I've got it at uh, time t equals 0. But this end is not at the right time. So I've got to track it back to this point and ask, how far is this point from the origin? That will be the length of the ruler in the O coordinates. OK, so how far do we have to track back? Uh, so this point here is at uh, t equals 0. And of course, x prime equal to L. Because in the, in the prime coordinates, this is the end of the ruler. Now, t equals 0 implies, uh, if we go to that formula up here, the third line, t equals 0, 
t prime is minus v x prime over c squared. So t prime is minus v l over c squared. Okay, so instead of being at t prime equals zero, it's tracked back on this t, t prime uh, in the t prime axis to this point. And now, of course, I can calculate what x is. So x is equal to gamma. This is from the final formula up there. x is gamma x prime plus vt prime. So gamma times l minus vl v squared l over c squared. So this is gamma times 1 minus v squared over c squared l. And remembering that gamma is 1 over square root of this factor, this is equal to 1 over gamma times l. So, uh, so the length of the ruler is 1 over gamma l of ruler in the O coordinates is 1 over gamma times L. And this is called, and remembering that gamma is bigger than 1, uh, this is called Lorentz contraction. It's a little bit generous to Lorentz because I think it was Einstein who figured out that it... Uh, Lorentz transformations correspond to time dilation and Lorentz contraction. So classical mechanics fails at step one in that uh, different observers measure different times and different lengths. Now, we're just going to prepare uh, the next, next uh, part of the discussion. I'm going to derive uh, Einstein, well, the most famous formula in physics, e equals mc squared. Um, we'll do it in no less than three different ways, okay, to persuade you that it might actually be true. And uh, um, so I'm just going to prepare for that discussion by elaborating what Einstein, what Maxwell knew, Maxwell and Maxwell's followers knew about the energy and momentum in the electromagnetic field. Okay, so there was some background around this that uh, physicists knew by the time of Einstein that electromagnetic radiation moves at the speed of light, it carries energy, it carries momentum, and that fact was the key to understanding that it's possible to convert mass into energy, okay? Uh, it was all implicitly there in electromagnetism. So I'm going to say a little about electromagnetism, and then uh, uh, and that was the basis for Einstein's, uh, Einstein's other 1905 paper, okay, where he uh, derived the formula E equals mc squared in three pages and without any references. You didn't need to refer to Maxwell, I guess. Everybody knew about Maxwell. And, and by the way, um, at the time of Einstein's paper, 1905, people didn't really understand what energy and momentum were, okay? People knew that en there's something called energy, it's conserved. There's something called momentum, it's conserved. They didn't really, really understand. What do I mean by really understand? Uh, I mean why there is something called energy which is conserved and why there's something called momentum which is conserved. Do you know who the person is who understood that and when they did it? Emmy Noether. Emmy Noether. Okay. And when did they 
When did she do it? I want to say around 1900, but I'm not here. 1915. The same year Einstein invented general relativity, Emmy Noether uh, discovered a symmetry argument which showed why energy is a conserved quantity, why momentum is a conserved quantity. And you see, energy is conserved because of the symmetry of space, uh, symmetry of uh, physics, under translations in time. If I do an experiment today, or if I do it tomorrow, I'll get the same result, if the world hasn't changed between today and tomorrow. Okay? And that's a symmetry, that it hasn't changed between today and tomorrow. And the consequence is that energy is conserved. And Emmy Noether discovered that. And secondly, if I do the experiment here, or if I do it there, and if the physical conditions are the same here as there, in other words, there's a symmetry under space, momentum is conserved. And Emmy Noether understood the connection between symmetry under translation in space and momentum. This was not really appreciated in, uh, in 1905, and it's one of the most uh, important insights, profound insights into physics, laid the basis for the entire field of particle physics in the 20th century, which was all about finding the symmetries and the conserved quantities uh, related to them. Yeah? Um, can you tell me the specific examples of energy and momentum? Yes. She, those specific she gave an argument which was completely general. In fact, I will give you the argument. Maybe I'll do it in the next lecture. It's a totally simple, simple argument, but an argument which everyone had missed. Newton, Maxwell, Hamilton, Poincaré, <laughs> all these people had missed this very profound fact. Okay? And now, because we're talking about time and space, and we're unifying them, according to Noether, uh, no surprise that the conserved quantities associated with shifts in time or shifts in space have to be related. And that's what the form momentum is. It's a it's a quantity which involves energy and momentum, and they are related, and the reason they exist, the reason the form momentum exists is because of translation invariant in space-time. And, uh, and so energy and momentum are intimately resist, uh, related. So because Einstein didn't know that, I'm going to give you just a quick, uh, and it's sort of an excuse to tell you a little bit more information about electromagnetism. I'm going to give you a quick discussion uh, in the, about energy and momentum in the electromagnetic field. I haven't got much time, so I'm only going to start. Magnetic field. So uh, Maxwell and others realized there must be energy in the field. I mean, the field is carrying light, and light can transmit heat. And therefore, there's got to be energy in this field. And they worked out that the energy density, OK, so maybe I'll call it rho e to distinguish it. Maybe that's a bad notation. Let me call it rho n, OK? Because so I've used rho for charge density. Uh, this is the energy density, rho energy. And this is a half epsilon naught e squared. Um, plus one half b squared over mu naught, um, and that's the expression for the energy density in the electric and magnetic fields. Uh, and then the energy flux, and that is the uh, rate of transfer of energy per unit area per unit uh, time. Jn, so these are the analogs of the same quantities for electric charge, but they're entirely expressed in terms of the electromagnetic field. This is 1 over mu naught times um, E cross B, and this was discovered by pointing. A wonderful name because the pointing vector points in the direction that the electromagnetic energy is traveling. Okay, and uh, the main result here is that the time rate of change of the energy density is minus the divergence of the pointing, uh, pointing vector.
So this was figured out by, um, uh, by people in the 19th century. And, you know, if our form, formalism of relativity is any use at all, it really should incorporate these things. We should be able to write those things in a much nicer way, too. Okay? And, indeed, that is the case, that these uh, combine to form the energy-momentum tensor. So the energy momentum tensor is actually a bigger quantity than uh, just rho and j, but it includes rho and j, and j. And the formula is the following, that t mu nu, it's a symmetric two-index tensor. And the, uh, it's given by one of a mu naught. And then it's quadratic in the field strengths. And so, uh, as you can see from over there, so it's alpha mu F alpha nu minus one quarter eta mu nu uh, times F alpha beta F alpha beta. So you can write down this quantity, uh, quadratic in the field strength tensor. And um, if you work out the, the uh, different components, you will find that uh, T00 is equal to rho, and T0i is equal to J. Oh, these are electromagnetic. Oh, sorry, energy. Energy. I. Okay, and the main property of it is that the divergence, the four-dimensional divergence, d mu t mu nu, okay, if d mu is just d by dx mu, d by dx mu, so the four-dimensional divergence means that I take a derivative and I contract the index with one of the two indices of the stress tensor. Um, then, so we can do that easily enough. Um, uh, so, so let's take uh, Maxwell with no currents or charges. So if I take Maxwell with, with J, J mu, uh, the electric current equal to zero, so just ordinary electromagnetic fields and nothing else, then the divergence of T mu nu over here, I'm going to get, um, you see the first term, I'm going to get uh, D mu F alpha mu, but this is zero by Maxwell's, the first Maxwell equation, because there's no current. Then over here, I'm going to get... Um, Uh, F alpha mu D mu F alpha nu. And from this term, I'm going to get minus. Now, the eta converts my partial derivative mu into partial derivative nu with an index raised. That derivative acts on these guys, but this is quadratic. So when I differentiate a square of something, I just get twice its value, so I get minus a half d nu f alpha beta f alpha beta. And um, this will give me um, one half 
mu naught. Uh, now, this term here, you see, this is um, anti-symmetric under alpha and mu. So I can write this term as d, uh, put a half and write d mu f alpha minus d alpha f mu. Okay? So this would, and that's helpful, as you'll see in a second. So I've taken the half out, and then I write d mu f alpha nu minus d alpha f mu nu. Uh, and then I have uh, minus one half f alpha beta d nu f alpha beta. And uh, now you see where I'm going, which is that Maxwell's the second Maxwell equation, in the first form I wrote it, which is just df plus cycles is zero, I have three terms. Yeah? Say again? Shouldn't the beta on top uh, of the first term? Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, why did I? Sorry, yes. Thank you. You. That's right? Okay. So, uh, so all I have to do is combine these terms. And this is 1 over 2 mu naught. Now, F is anti-symmetric. So let us uh, uh, mentally imagining, imagine uh, lowering this index. You don't need a half on this third term, right? Do you? Uh, sorry, there's a half outside. Thank you. Sorry, lots of mistakes. No half there. Uh, in this term, you see if I lower the new index, switch the new and mu, and raise the new index, I get a minus sign. So basically, I end up with um, f alpha mu, and then um, d mu f alpha nu plus d alpha f new mu. Okay, so I'm trying to be careful that this, this new index was second in this formula, but now it's shifted over to first, and when I flip the order of the new and mu indices, I got a minus sign. And then let's combine it with this guy. So that is just uh, plus d new f new alpha. So you notice I've relabeled the indices. Alpha, beta, alpha, beta has become alpha mu, uh, mu alpha. So I've relabeled beta equal to mu. And because I've switched the order, I put a minus sign. OK, but this is 0, because that quantity is 0 by Maxwell's second equation. Second equation, which is just that d alpha f gamma delta plus cycles equals zero. Okay, so what we've shown is that according to Maxwell's equations with no currents, this quantity uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, the divergence of the stress, stress energy tensor is zero. Um, that will be enough to show that there are a set of quantities, energy and momentum, which are conserved. Uh, it's enough to show, in fact, what it shows is this equation plus, um, plus another equation, which gives you the conservation law for momentum. So we'll do that next time. Any other, uh, any other questions? I just want to, uh, while you're thinking of a question, uh, let me just emphasize one other theme in relativity, electromagnetism in relativity, which is unification. 
Okay. What's happened is we Maxwell succeeded in putting electric and magnetic fields together into one quantity. So he unified electricity with magnetism. Einstein and Lorentz unified space and time. Okay. Uh, this whole notion that physics could be simplified and unified, uh, simplified through unifying it, okay, is what set the whole agenda for 20th century fundamental physics. People were trying to simplify by unifying. And uh, if we look at where we are today, there are certain sort of uh, strange things we don't understand. Uh, probably the strangest is the energy in the vacuum. We know from cosmology there's energy in the vacuum, vacuum energy. We don't know what it is. We don't know how to unify it with the other parts of physics. Um, we, uh, and and uh, similarly with the Higgs boson, there are big questions. How exactly does it manage to consistently unify with other areas of physics? How do we unify gravity, uh, quantum gravity, with uh, the rest of physics? Um, uh, so, so this theme, you know, what we're doing throughout this course is basically trying to unify things in order to simplify, uh, in order to simplify them. So now there must be a question. <laughs> No questions. Okay, I was too clear. I'll try and be more confusing. <laughs> I'll try and be more confusing next time. All right. Well, you have a bit of a break. <laughs> <laughs>